Hello there, and welcome to another episode of Legal Unicorns. Uh, I'm your host, Rob Green, and today I'm delighted to be joined by Frida Levitsky. I'll give you a little introduction to Frida in a second, but really it's the purpose of this quick episode is really to uh, delve into what it's like transferring from practice to in-house, back to practice, and then setting yourself up as as a consultant, uh, perhaps overseas as well, which uh, Frida has done all of and the above. Um, And it's really come from, as I was just telling Frida off camera, it's really come from so many requests that we have had um, uh, from senior lawyers who are maybe a little bit nervous about taking that first step into consultancy and what it means and what it looks like. And in addition to that, as again, I was just explaining to Frida, for those of you who may have read our recent research report, uh, which was entitled The Three Meta Trends of Work, um, we've discovered through partnerships and research that we've read and some of the work that our research team has done is specifically based on uh, the LexisNexis report that stated that 30% of all uh, solicitors in the UK would be working in the gig economy by 2026, which is only now two and a half years away. Uh, And that means that 30% of all solicitors in the UK will be working for themselves as a consultant uh, and not as uh, as a traditional employee. Our research team then went on to dig a little bit deeper, bring in global research, and the feeling and the numbers and the data are saying that possibly by 2035, that globally that could be as high as 70% of the legal professional workforce working for themselves or on a project basis as opposed to the traditional employee. So first and foremost, thank you and welcome, Frida. Thanks again for joining us. It's an absolute pleasure. Gosh, I didn't realise the numbers were so high. That's that's quite quite impressive, hey? Whew, 70%. Yeah, I think um, it, it is impressive, and it's uh, and it's just signifying this enormous shift in work and the way that people want to work and and the way that uh, legal services are going to be delivered going forward. And um, we all know that law, as as wonderful as a industry and sector as it is took a little bit of time to, to sort of techno- take technology by the horns and, and really start driving change. Um, and that is really, really happening. So I want to get quickly into you um, and in your journey, if I may. Um, and I'll, I'll try not do my usual, which is to jump around and, and ask 50 different things <laughs> at once. But really, I just want to get to grips and tell so the listeners who are perhaps feeling like they want to go in the same direction as you, you um, know, what maybe some of the decisions that you made that got you there. And, and it's probably just before I jump in, it's probably worth me noting as well that, and I will probably get this wrong, but you've had a stellar career and a wonderful global career, um, working in the law across Uh, London, Hong Kong, Singapore, Dubai, Geneva, and now South Africa. But your work, (laughs) yeah, which is amazing. Uh, But your work actually goes much further than that, right? I mean, it covers even more borders and countries and cities than that. So I think you're in a really unique position to be able to explain to people uh, who are listening how to take those next career steps. So first and foremost, when you went into practice, you know, I'm not going to say way back when, but when you started your career, and which I think was at Norton Rose, is that right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, in London, and you were a fresh-faced associate. You'd just uh, been admitted. Did you, at that time, if you can think back, did you think that you might stay in practice your whole career? Did you see that traditional career path ahead of you as, uh, to be a partner? Still, still fresh-faced-ish, but. Uh... <laughs> Um, do you know what? Yes, I thought I was going to be a partner from day one. So I went in, I was one of those trainees that was super, super keen. And I put myself, I think it was month three that I had volunteered to be part of the HSBC key client program. And, you know, I, I was exposed to Roger Berkby, I think it was, who was the managing partner at the time and, and Margaret and, you know, everybody who was like, the people I needed to know, the whole executive committee was involved. So, 
so I knew like I, I kind of knew how to play the field from a very young age to be seen and to show my capability even though there was that naivety and probably a little bit of arrogance in those younger years um, but I do remember seeing I think it was John Perry becoming uh, a partner and the youngest partner at Norton Rose sorry that's my dog shaking um, the youngest partner at Norton Rose at the time and thinking right I'm going to do that a year younger I'm going to make I'm going to be the youngest partner so yeah no I saw myself being in private practice my entire career yeah that's and, and I suspect that's what most lawyers feel when they become admitted uh, uh, that that is their career path uh, and you know we won't go into too much on this uh, particular episode but uh, one of the things I touched on in, in a speech uh, about the future of legal careers back in November was um, was that when, say 20 years ago, when lawyers were stepping into the career of a lawyer, there really wasn't as many options as there is now and, and, and possibly mm -hmm. that, that will be going forward. But, okay. okay, so without rushing through your career, which has been, again, stellar to date, uh, it's really, where do you remember when you started getting the sense of perhaps uh, what might appeal about in-house and a move into the, the corporate side? And, and, and do you remember what it was that appealed to you about that? So initially I went on to comment in-house. So it wasn't, it wasn't a, a choice initially. Um, I really wouldn't have had a clue what in-house involved had I not had that opportunity. Um, but once I had experienced it, the thing that I loved about in-house was the, the less legal side of it and the more business and strategy and the fact that I wasn't just doing legal things. It was a lot more practical. I had to provide advice that was legal advice, but with a lot more flexibility and practical applicability. Um, and that required different skill sets. It required more involvement with the tax team and the accounting team and the board of directors. Um, it was it was more involved. It was more fun. I, I, I really enjoyed the, the 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 chance to actually travel when I was working in house to actually go and see the projects, which I didn't get to do as an associate because it would have, wouldn't have been very cost effective for the client. Whereas when you're in house, you know, you're required to to actually go and see what you're working on. So that the appeal was being closer to the ground and not being at the beck of call at my clients, which is what you are when you're in, in private practice. <laughs> so. Yeah, I suppose it's a complete change, isn't it? You're going from doing specific pieces of work for the client, um, and obviously there's all the challenges of, of the charge out rate and the hours mm -hmm. it's taking, and there's a whole different way of delivering that project. And then when you're in-house, you're much closer to the business, you're much more... Yeah like you've said, they're strategic, you're looking at reasons why you're doing it. You, you know, I, I guess even probably from day one, you're seeing the impact of what the, the work that the lawyer does from, from practice has on the business uh, yeah. in terms of if it's wrong, it slows everything down. And if it's right, yeah, I, I, I get you there. I, when you crossed over from practice to in-house, was there anything that you can remember that was a was potentially a particular downside or, or, or anything that, apart from what we've just said, is there anything that was... My, my um, one of the things I remember everybody saying is that if you go in-house work, you work a lot less hours and it's so much easier. And I think I worked just as hard, if not harder, when I moved from private practice to in-house. I think that's a complete farce, depending on how the in-house legal team is structured. So, for example, I used to work for Louis Dreyfus and we did a lot of work hands on. So we drafted, we negotiated as the in-house legal team with sometimes the support of external counsel, but we led the team. So I know that some in-house teams rely very heavily on external counsel. And so work is it's more like oh, a quick check of things to move on. So I would imagine that there is a, a much greater shift towards if we're going to invest in you, you'll do the work versus relying on external counsel, unless you absolutely need them for, you know, litigation or legal opinions or, you know, the, the, the big stuff that's got high exposure. 
Yeah, uh, that's interesting you, you bring that up, actually, because it's a, something that we've noticed with a lot of lawyers that I've helped and we've helped uh, with their careers. The Yeah, and there was always that perception that it was going to be an easier life, that, that I wouldn't have to work all hours uh, God sends. But more and more people are realizing now that part of the in-house role is to actually reduce the cost that, that, that is being spent on external counsel. Um, therefore, you know, yeah, you might have to work a, a little bit longer. Um, well, that, that, but it's interesting that you, that you found that. And then in, in terms of your specific career, when you were at Louis Dreyfus in Switzerland um, uh, uh, for a number of years, but then, again, I know that, I know personally, because from times we've spoken before, you then took some time off and travelled, and one of the reasons you, en uh, you ended up in, in Cape Town. But what did you, when you, was that really the, the, was it time to take a bit of a break? Was that the reason that you, that you moved away from in-house? Was it time to travel, regenerate yourself, rejuvenate yourself, or, or were there other reasons for moving away from in-house? Yeah, to be honest, yes. I, the the the, the reason I didn't not love, I didn't not. There's a good double negative for you. I loved <laughs> my job. I loved being a lawyer. Except what I realised that was that law was everything. So my job had become so intertwined in every other aspect of my life that there was no reprieve from it. So, for example, my romantic relationships, my friendships, my social life, my sporting career, because I ended up going and running with my friends from work. Um, my, um, yeah, every, everything about my life had an element of work in it. So there was no reprieve and there was no, there was no kind of external perspective. So when things became difficult, as they always do at some stage in, in your daily working life, you know, you're going to have face conflict. I didn't have anybody to go back to and talk and, and to kind of take myself away from. So I took a year out to regain that perspective and to regain balance in my life, which was very much missing. Um, and it gave me a chance to go, actually, I really do love being a lawyer, but can I do things differently? This is so important, especially, uh, for, it's really one of the key reasons why I wanted to talk to you, because I know that there's so many lawyers, thousands, if not tens of thousands of lawyers out there thinking about the same thing, feeling the same thing, probably needing a bit of a break, needing to re-energize. Um, and so hearing from you that, is, uh, that has ultimately made such a success of taking that break and, and, and being good to yourself, is it's an important step in your journey, but it's something that I think some, of, some people are quite scared of. Were you, yeah. were you apprehensive when you... Did you feel like you were giving up your identity or was there anything that when you took it was break, less it was less nervous. about giving up my identity because I was always going to be a lawyer it was it was the fear of what if I can't get another job after you know it, it wasn't going on sabbatical I was I was quitting I was leaving for good without any security of coming back and I remember talking to a friend of mine, Caesar, at the time, and he just he went through this list of questions with me on, you know, do you have enough experience? You know, are you a good lawyer? Are you capable? Do you have enough of a network and connections? You know, do you have do, are you regularly in touch with people so that you can build a network again when you're ready to come back? So really simple questions that challenge this false belief that I was holding that I'd never get a job again, which is worst case scenario thinking and, and actually bringing it back and going, actually, there's nothing to suggest that I can, I cannot do this again. There's nothing that has, I've never failed before in finding a job. Why should it be different this time? So it was really challenging those, those false beliefs that potentially could have kept me locked in a career where I knew I needed a change. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that's incredible advice for everybody as well, because it, it's so much of, of taking that break that one needs or making that change one needs. So much of the, but perhaps the decision not to do it is driven by your own fears and, and, mm. and your own head telling you, that, well, it sounds like your friend Caesar there was brilliant. And, yeah, he was um, very good. I'll wasn't have, even a, wasn't to, even a coach. <laughs> 
I was going to say, I have to get him on the podcast and, and, uh, and get those questions uh, because that's a really valuable thing. And, and uh, you know, I think uh, j- just to add to that from my own experience, I remember when I, when I made the decision to go out on my own, uh, my wife, Marie, who you know, uh, had the same conversation with me that similar was well, similar to what the one that Caesar had with you, which is she just kept sat me down and just said, look, you know, if it doesn't work, would, what, what would you do? Would you be able to get another job? Would you be able to, are you a good recruiter? Are you good at what you do? Do you, are, you know, have you got the energy and the fire and the passion? And all the answers were yes. And it was like, well, then go Give make go. some mistakes. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. um, well, that's, I mean, we all need a little bit of that and that's great. And this is why I think this, this, this particular interview is going to be really useful for people who probably yeah. are sitting there going, oh, should I do it? Should I do it? Well, the answer is, is yes. Now, as you, uh, you went on your travels and uh, you, uh, um, you, you then came back into the workforce when you were, when you were ready um, and you started working for Mothers to Mothers and you became a partner at uh, Eversheds and, uh, and, then you, uh, and then you worked for a, a number of years doing that, uh, if I remember rightly, just a handful of years um, before, before your passion for, well, first of all, for consulting on your own, but also for your fantastic business, which we must give a shout out to, Braving Boundaries, uh, which you can please tell us all about that in a second. But I want to say congratulations because you're celebrating your third birthday uh, this, this month. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> fantastic. Amazing. And, and it, it's so lovely for, for me because I remember the beginning, um, the beginning. which is uh, which is fantastic. But that, again, is something that you uh, were very brave in doing. Um, and but so when you when you were working and you were again, I guess, salaried uh, and, and you were, you know, you were uh, what really what made the decision to 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 consult and to to take the leap to set up your own well two businesses that of your own so well i suppose first of all there was a clear intention from my part to set up a consultancy and there was two reasons for that one is um <laughs> oh dear i don't know this is very much my personality so i'll i'll i'll, I'll try and explain it from that perspective i'm not very good with hierarchy so the legal institutions, particularly private practice, is very hierarchical. So there is an expectation that you will respect people based on their position and not really challenge positions. So I'm very much of the view, and I've been brought up this way by my parents, of, no, everybody is treated the same. Everybody earns respect based on the way that they treat other people. But, you know, everybody's equal. So I struggle with hierarchy as an individual. Um, I like to be able to talk to everybody and, and treat everybody the same. So so that I had a, as a problem with private practice as a whole. And then the second point, which leads on from that really is conforming. So co- conformity is not really one of my strengths either, either, which I struggled, particularly in private practice, with how many people you had to ask permission from in order to get anything done. I thought it was one of the most ineffective forms of business model. I didn't agree with with um, billable hours. I don't really agree with the pressure of, of having this massive revenue target and you're a failure if you don't hit certain targets. I don't think it's a healthy mentality to work in. Um, you know, we were planning on setting up the Cape Town office and 20 different people had to have a say in it. I, I was like, I believed that I could run a consultancy on a much more cost effective and efficient basis and and still be successful. So it was a break away from restriction and conformity, which is very much my Enneagram 7 personality, I've realized since then, but also efficiency and freedom, which is the opposite of the restriction of being able to do it the way I want to do it without having to get permission. So. Yeah, that, that was why I left. Did it come with its own set of fears? Of course it did. <laughs> so. Yeah, I think that, that again, though, is uh, something that the listeners of this uh, interview will, will, it will resonate with, with many people. 
is that there's something that doesn't quite sit with them in that law firm model and they just they're not maybe 100 percent sure what to do about it now so trailblazers and, and brave professionals like yourself have, have made that path and said no we can do it we can do it in a in a different way that suits your personality that suits the way that you want to work and the the, cl the clients i guess are delighted that they're getting you know this expert service um you know still uh, you know when they need it um and and at the level they need it at but you the deliverer are much happier in respect of uh, mm. the, the environment yeah. you work in which you know i mean we it would be hard to tell but you're certainly happier delivering it that way so perhaps yeah. your work is even even uh, even better well certainly with a smile anyway i guess <laughs> <laughs> yeah big smile on it <laughs> now at the same time you were setting up the consultancy uh, there there um and again i'll be i'll be sensitive to this but one of the big fears for people who are setting up on their own um, um, is that where am I going to get the work from? Um, and I and I and again, I'm I'm being sensitive because obviously I yeah. appreciate that there's, you know, you I, I you know there are sensitivities around that that kind of thing. Confidentiality, um, compete confidentiality, and and um, and, um, and that kind of thing. But you, um, but. Is there anything that you could say to people that are a bit worried about a, a bit worried about that? Is there any tips you've given people? So the way that I got comfortable with it, I suppose, is that um, granted I didn't have a non compete, so that that I, I actually would make absolutely no difference whether I did or I didn't, because the reality is is that um, law your law firm clients or your in-house clients it's you build relationships with your clients it's got nothing to do with who owns what and this that and the other is that like people that your clients want to work with you as a lawyer so i had brought my clients in i had nurtured them i had built the relationship with them when i left they didn't know anybody else to work with and they didn't want to work with anybody else. So whether I had a big brand behind me or not, wasn't stealing anything. I mean, I literally was, I, I literally just went, I, I'm sorry, I'm leaving. And they said, right, where are you going? Right, how do you, how do we, how do we sign up? And I said, well, you know, I don't have the big professional indemnity insurance behind me and I don't have, I can't give legal opinions. I'm, I'm setting up a consultancy model, I'm not, I'm not a law firm, you know, I'm, you're going out, you want expert opinion, you go out. No, no, we want basically an in-house counsel or we want, you know, whatever model it is, a consultant. And that was, that was what they wanted. And it was, so it's about the relationship. If you've got clients who you solely work with and they love working with you, they will follow. And if they don't, then, you know, the other part of it, and you know, not everybody came with me. So it was a case of going, well, actually, how do I go out? I'm going to go out to my network. They know me. I've got, you know, I've got a ton of, I've looked after my friends and my colleagues. I've stayed in touch with them for the years. I reached out. There we go. Um, I reached out to them and said, this is what I'm doing. I'm setting up a consultancy. I then went and physically did a marketing trip. So I put some money out into the business and I went and, and explored that side of things, caught up with people just had conversations telling them about what I was doing. And then when they needed me, they knew where to come. Brilliant advice. And it, uh, I'm taking so much away from that as well. The, the, you've made it sound very simple. Um, but, and, I, and I know that there's a lot of lawyers that are very challenged mm -hmm. by that sort of putting themselves out there and that business development edge. But hearing the way that you've delivered that uh, is yes, it takes a little bit of guts to get out there and put yourself out there, but it's you've made it sound very comfortable, and I'm sure that people will appreciate that um, when the when best, they when they come to do it for themselves. Yeah, the best um, piece of advice I can give from that is that know your personality. So, and and I suppose this is the best piece of advice I can give is that you need to be confident, not arrogant, when you are when you're going out marketing yourself. 
So arrogance is wandering around with this air of superiority and I know everything and nobody needs to help me. And, you know, I'm the, I, I am the God. Um, confidence has a humility attached to it. And you know that you don't know everything. You know, you're not the best at everything, but you do believe in yourself. You know, your strengths, you know, your capabilities and you, ha you, you base that on previous experience that you've got. And that's what you take forward. So I had to build up my confidence in order to market. And I did this, whether in private practice or, or as a consultant, is that to go out, I needed to go, well, where are my strengths? Where is my, where can I add value? Where can I help people? Where am I comfortable doing this? So, you know, for example, doing an STF transaction, I hated doing them. I can do them, but I'm like, oh, Oh, I don't want to do that. Mergers and acquisitions, corporate, cool. I'm very happy there. Commodities, very happy. Africa, very happy. So, you know, it's where do I want to work? Who do I want to work with? And how can I express that? And where, you know, how can I passionately express that to do it? So I don't sell, I don't go out going, I'm the best lawyer in this, this, this. I go out and say, should we have a chat? You know, I want to hear about your business. How's your wife? How's your husband? You know, I, I want to know the person behind the business. I have a very heart-centered approach to business, not a head-centered approach. Wonderful. And I think it's a, there is obviously other fears that people may have, you know, how much of a runway have they got in their bank to be able to, to you know, to sort of, you know, give them the space to build it. And there'll be other issues, but you've summed it up perfectly there in the sense that it's, it's really about being true to yourself uh, at the start um, and remembering the skills you bring and, 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 and approaching it in your way. Now, with you, um, I've got two quick other questions, but the, the, were there, have there been any downsides that you care to share of, of working for yourself as a consultant? Uh, admin. I have to do my admin and um, marketing. <laughs> so at the beginning, there was a lot of upfront cost. So, you know, I, I had budgeted for that before I set out just so I could, I had the budget to go and market because that's where your money spend is at the beginning. Um, that is a downside because, you know, you don't see it. I suppose it's the lack of security can really worry you. I was fortunate, um, you know, I, I had... A couple of clients that came with me straight away so I, I wasn't as exposed but I, I had kind of prepared in case I was um, but security is is the biggest downside for consultancy is that you know clients leave so it's they need you for a time then you have to go out and market again potentially or you know or you build in a retainer model and and you know you keep your clients for x number of months so I think my, yeah, my, a big piece of advice is that know your personality. If you're somebody who absolutely loves security and the comfort of a monthly paycheck of the same amount, then I would really question whether consultancy is the right direction for you. Um, if it is, no, no, I'm quite, I'm quite risk, risk capable and I believe in myself, I've got the confidence that I can do this, then give it a whirl. Um, but yeah, I do think, I think it's the, personality. The security aspect is something that we deal with here at GRM a lot because it's obviously dealing with people with, with who either looking for a new change or, or, or looking uh, or have been made redundant or whatever it may be. The, the security aspect is something that we discuss a lot with people. Um, and, and I think as the older you get as well, sometimes you realise that there isn't as much security in a full-time position as you as wish. COVID, as COVID has proven, hey? So as COVID has proven and then now we've got all the tech layoffs and I know that that's now extended to uh, South Africa because I know people in the tech space who've just list, literally this week already have found out that they've lost their jobs. So it's, wow. it's, uh, it's, it's, you know, you're, without sounding crass and callous, it's, you're, the writing can be on the wall, your name can be on that list in a, in, in, in how, uh, in a big company anyway. But, but that's good to know, you know, I, I'm glad you brought that back. Thank you for that, which is, you know, know yourself know your risk appetite almost and, and be true to yourself. Now, yeah, and I suppose then the opportunity is, you know, it's not just consultancy is the option. It's, okay, if I need the security, are there other job opportunities 
is there in-house opportunity? Is there a, a different private practice? Is there a smaller firm that gives you more flexibility? You know, there's different, there's different pathways. Absolutely. And now we have projects like uh, with uh, alternative legal service providers and th they work yeah. in a slightly different way as well, which is fantastic. But I want to get on to, before I let you go and have your day, um, the, uh, I want to talk about braving boundaries if I can, because mm -hmm. alongside your consultancy that you were setting up to do your legal work, you also ventured into the, um, uh, the coaching space, the, the one on one coaching space, uh, specifically at the beginning for lawyers. Uh, but I know that that's now extended to a lot of different professions as well. Could you tell us about Braving Boundaries and how it's gone and, and, uh, and what it's really given you as a professional in terms of your soul and enabled you to, to, to experience? Yeah, so Braving Boundaries stemmed from the fact that <laughs> when you say you've got a split personality, it sounds a bit dodgy, but <laughs> I do. I have a split personality. I have a very legal analytical mind and I love being a lawyer, but I have this big heart and soul part of me that, that just wants to help people. And part, it's probably partly to do with the fact that I'm middle-aged now and I've got a much more generative and, and external view of the world and want to, to help people. So, um, Braving Boundaries was to really help on the mental health side of law initially and helping people who had struggled in ways that I had whilst I was in legal practice and giving them an outlet to be able to voice their concerns, to deal with their stress, to deal with the overwhelm, for help helping those people that felt lost and stuck in their careers or, or personal life because everything gets affected by big, big you know, demanding careers, particularly ones that demand so much of your time. So that was the original step. I then realized that a lot of people that weren't lawyers were coming to me as well. So we expanded out of just the legal industry. And now it focuses on individuals, but it also uses the Enneagram to help people understand their personalities and build self-awareness more. And last year it expanded into dogs are going to bark, <laughs> expanded into the, the corporate team environment um, to help teams communicate better. Because again, it's all about relationships, whether it's with clients and, the, and, and, clients and their lawyer or within the internal teams. Um, and that's, that's, that's the focus now is, is really to help people communicate better with themselves in their own lives and, and within their corporate environment. And um, people can reach you on bravingboundaries.com and then I know that you're over uh, the <laughs> socials as well. Um, <laughs> the, uh, sorry. The, um, how did you find it starting the two businesses in conjunction with each other? Was it tough to split your time? I guess, you know, three years in, you're much, it's much more fluid in terms of the way that you... Uh, you know, the, how you split your time, but it, was it difficult at the beginning uh, to, to find the time for both? Uh, initially, there was a pull between, oh, what, what do I put myself out as? Am I a lawyer? Am I a coach? Oh, which one sounds better? And I could feel the identity of the lawyer trying to push its way forward to the front. Splitting time... No, because I had entered into a retainer with, with my main clients, so they got allocated hours, and I had specifically preserved time for Braving Boundaries So and the development of it. So I, I'd actually managed, bizarrely for me, I'd actually managed that <laughs> quite well. Um, and, um, yeah, I was very conscious that it didn't. I didn't want this just as a, like, a fun project on the side. I wanted it to develop into a, a business because it help. It really does help help people. Um, so that was what I was. I was very conscious of doing it. And I must say, you know, we were talking about the downsides of, of, of owning your own consultancy. There's a ton of upsides as well, which is you manage your own time. You know, I can enter retainers to provide some comfort from a security, you know, monthly security perspective. Um, I don't have a pension, but I've got a savings plan. There's, there's different alternatives, which, you know, so as an, I don't get the employment benefits, but I can cater for that. Um, I can take a month off. I'm getting married in 
what eight days time and I've taken the whole of whole of April off so you know there is there is and, and no one's whinging at me so there, there are a lot of benefits as well but it does and, and and the fact that I can run two separate businesses without anyone challenging that and questioning whether I'm dedicating sufficient time and also that we were talking earlier about that big revenue model of you've got to hit those targets hit 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 I can actually work more if I want to, or I can take that month off if I want to, and I can adjust my monetary flow depending on what what I feel like I need it at that point. So there's the benefit side of consultancy and working for yourself when you're looking, you know, in contrast to the, the difficulties as well. And I will add to that as well in terms of working for yourself. One of the things that I discovered, uh, and I'm sure you have as well, is that you get to work with who you want to work with um yes you know i mean i guess at the beginning you've you know you've got to try and get the money in or your situation was slightly different to maybe mine but as time's gone on you get to select and that goes back to the 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 way you put it was really nice with having sort of a heart-centric approach it's you know what i've found is that i I'm going to work with people that I want, that I like, and that I yes. that I can believe in, and and that aren't going to and, and are going to treat me with respect as well. That's so key, and and you're right. Is is that yes? At the beginning, there can be that kind of fear driven approach to I've got to get the, I've got to get the money through the door. I've got to do this. I've got to do this. Okay, maybe maybe that is the case at the beginning, but actually, fewer clients who pay better and you like working with is way more valuable than lots of clients who pay shit and don't have any respect for you. Sorry, I shouldn't have sworn on, on like no, live, but, but, but who, <laughs> who, who, who don't respect you. I've built mm. in my contract with my, my clients at the moment, each has a, a clause in there that says, I'm taking a month off, you're not to contact, <laughs> contact me for April. And they're all like, oh, you know, fine, sign off. You've got it, you're getting married and going on honeymoon, brilliant. How respectful that is, 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 is beyond. They all know, they're all excited for me. There's a plan in place to cover, it's good. And it's a proper partnership. It's yeah. a proper partnership between you and your client and, and it's getting the best out of you. And, and yeah, there's, there's so many upsides. Before I let you go, is there any final message that you might think of that you would give anyone who's battling with the, with the, the, the idea of perhaps moving into a consulting position as a, as a lawyer um no i think it's i think i've said it all but i mean so the hmm. key points are confidence is key so build up your confidence will your will you have clients that will come with you or can you find clients do you have the do you have the financial capability to just to buffer yourself and you know do you have the experience to be able to go if you're two years junior associate and you want to become a consultant I would question that. Do you have the right experience? Yes, you can have experience from all walks of life. You do need legal experience. There is value in having training under you before you become a consultant, in my opinion. Um, and don't think small. So when you go in, become a consultant, there is that kind of, oh, you know, I'm only, I'm only a consultant. Oh don't have the big brand behind me anymore. You know, I can only do certain things. I can't start hitting top value clients. That is BS. You can, they can come in. You, 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 if you've got experience, you can go and market yourself and you can be really sure that you can deliver a good pro product and, and go and find those clients that need you. So you've got to remember that you were talking about the shift into consultancy and why that is. The reason is, is that Firms don't want to pay the big bucks to external law firms, like hundreds of thousands of pounds, still in pounds, I'm still British, hundreds of thousands of pounds who are on a yearly basis. Um, they also don't want to bring in necessarily a full-time in-house legal team. So there's this hybrid approach that's coming of having kind of a quasi in-house counsel role, quasi GC role. You know, we need you when we need you, or we need you just for a few hours every week or month. So think differently, think bigger, don't, don't limit yourselves. I love that advice. Don't think small. It's really, really, really sound advice. And yeah, you've just hit the nail on the head there uh, 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 with regard to the way that clients are determining that legal services is, is, 
to be delivered in a, I don't want to say cheaper, but in a, in a more cost effective yeah, way more cost effective. Um, it yeah. has led to this change in the industry. So look, I'm going to let you go. I want to, I want everybody first step to, to go on to bravingboundaries.com and, uh, and try and get some of Frida's time, uh, find out about yourself, find out about whether it's for you. Um, but certainly, um, reach out to her on the socials as well. Follow her fantastic newsletter, which you can sign up to, I think, on the website, if I'm right, yeah. um, bravingboundaries.com. The, all the links will be in the, uh, below anyway. Um, but Frida is one of the real, true trailblazers that I've met. She uh, has unique experience in the legal space, unique to South Africa because, we, uh, because of your global experience and exposure. You are uh, my friend. I'm so very br proud of you. I'm so proud of everything you've achieved in terms of braving boundaries in your own consultancy. You are someone I look up to. Um, I'm really looking forward to your wedding. Um, <laughs> well, yours yeah. and Justin, I must say, your, your husband-to-be, is his day as well um, <laughs> in, a, in a week or so's time. Uh, thank you so much, Frida. Thank you so much for your time uh, sharing uh, your, your journey with us today. Um, it's going to be invaluable advice for people. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And I'll see you very soon. You will. Thanks.